Our next speaker is Dr. Sunil Apte um, from the Cleveland Clinic Learner Research Institute and our second American Heart Association Allen Distinguished Investigator. Uh, thank you. So the backdrop to the slide you see is a ancient mosaic I photographed in Greece recently. Uh, if you can imagine it, the tiles are cells and what's between the cells is extracellular matrix. Uh, in some places the tiles are packed closely together with little intervening matrix and in other places it's quite abundant and there are no cells present. This is exactly how our body is. There are places, there are organs which have very specialized structures, different amount of relative quantities of matrix and cells and so on. Uh, so in this mosaic, the matrix is structural. But in our bodies, in addition, it fulfills essential roles in uh, signaling. It tells cells which way is up and which way is down. Uh, the matrix is a storehouse for morphogens and other information that can be regulated uh, in terms of gradients and, and release. Um, <clears throat> one other point of, uh, in relation to this mosaic is uh, that just as this mosaic is old, many of the mechanisms for maintaining this matrix are highly conserved throughout all multicellular organisms. In contrast to this mosaic, however, our bodies and other organisms are not static in terms of how they handle that matrix. It's in constant flux by the minute, changing especially in our bones and locomotor structures. So uh, that turnover takes place uh, both as a result of uh, regulated biosynthesis and regulated proteolysis. And so I'm going to speak today briefly to the function of proteases in regulating the ECM. So the biology of a protease is really the biology of uh, its substrates. So if we want to understand how proteases work, we have to identify their substrates, and that gives us ingress into the pathways in which proteases work. And so uh, proteolysis is an irreversible modification. The proteases digest the substrates, and you can either gain a, an effect by the creation of new proteoforms that have new functions, or you can lose a function because you've degraded a biologically relevant molecule. So um, we took, uh, we're taking two approaches to understand matrix turnover. One of these we term reverse degradomics. In this instance, we take uh, mice with defined genetic uh, mutations, and we ask which matrix molecules accumulate in the, in the mutant mice as a way of identifying physiological substrates in developmental phenotypes. And the other is uh, forward degradomics, where we can do one of two things. We can take a library of matrix molecules, we can add a protease to it, and we can determine the sites uh, uh, of, of cleavage. The other is to take a human disease state where we can examine the entire landscape of proteolysis in an unbiased way, and this potentially provides both mechanisms of disease as well as biomarkers and other diagnostic tools. So for the reverse genetics part, we focused on a very large family of proteases, which is similar to the matrix metalloproteases that some of you may know in many respects. Uh, this large family of proteases contains many uh, evolutionarily duplicated uh, proteases. Uh, this is one of the hallmarks of this family. And I'm going to show you two uh, case studies uh, from within the family. One is a pair of duplicated enzymes called ADAMTS6 and ADAMTS10, which are both involved in human disease. And the second pair of ADAMTS9 and ADAMTS20 was of great interest to us because these are among the most evolutionarily conserved of all secreted metalloproteases in our genomes. So the uh, Adam TS6 knockout mice uh, die uh, before birth. They have a profound uh, developmental phenotype. You can see here a defect uh, in the limbs. Uh, the limbs are malrotated. The hind limbs are shorter. This gene is also very highly expressed in the heart, as you can see on your right. The red signal is an in situ hybridization signal for Adam TS6 RNA and shows it highly expressed in the myocardium and in the outflow tract. So uh, these mice have a complex cardiac anomaly uh, that approximates uh, a couple of human anomalies. The most visible of these is uh, an aorta and a pulmonary artery that both arise from the right ventricle. That's called a double outlet right ventricle. So uh, using these proteomics approaches uh, and biochemistry, we've recently identified a unique cleavage site in a matrix molecule called fibrillin-2, which forms uh, macromolecular fibrils that are visible on electron microscopy in the matrix. So you can see here that the uh, active enzyme is capable of producing uh, fragments of uh, fibrillin-2, whereas a catalytically inactive mutant can't do the job. 
the, the homologue of this enzyme, ADMTS10, is also capable of cleaving fibrillin 2. So uh, you can see the uh, effect of that in situ, uh, accumulation of fibrillin 2 shown here in green in ADMTS10, knockout uh, cardiac outflow tract, uh, uh, perhaps a bit more in the ADMTS6 knockout. And if you make a double knockout of the two, which we do routinely for all the homologous proteases, you see an additive effect of uh, increased fibrillin 2. And so this accumulation of fibrillin 2 prompted us to go back to the biology to ask, how important is this accumulation of fibrillin 2 to the phenotype? And what we saw was that essentially deletion of one copy of fibrillin 2 essentially reversed both the cardiac and skeletal defects. So here you can see that the, uh, uh, the limbs, the hind limbs in the uh, ADMTS6 knockout minus one copy of fibrillin 2 look very similar to those in the wild type and definitely more normal than the knockout. The same goes for the heart. So here is a normal uh, aortic outflow tract. Uh, this is the double outlet right ventricle in the ADMTS6 knockout. And we now uh, lose the double outlet right ventricle. But the rotation of the base of the heart on the apex hasn't been fully rescued so that they still have what's called an overriding aorta. And this can be quantitated and scored at the phenotypic level, as you see in the table below. Uh, so here in the skeleton, this is the uh, mutant ADMTS6 phenotype, and you can see restoration to normal by deleting just one copy of the substrate, which had accumulated in excess. Naturally, the pathways by which this work is of interest, because ADMTS6 uh, cleaves fibrillin 2, fibrillin 2 binds to a number of morphogens, and so these are some of the uh, follow-up studies that we'll do in these knockouts. In another uh, pair of knockouts, in the ADAMTS9 and ADAMTS20 knockout, these are the most evolutionary conserved of all proteases. We see a profound effect on mouse development, and one of those defects, in addition to defects in the heart and limbs, is an open neural tube. Uh, here we've uh, taken off the top of a wild-type neural tube and looked at the cilia in the uh, neuroepithelium in the wild-type and the mutant. And you can see that the mutant uh, neural tube uh, cells have extremely short or absent uh, cilia. So this is a secreted protease that is essential for ciliogenesis and mediates uh, sonic hedgehog signaling, which is required for neural tube closure. So I won't have the time to show you all that data, but I will show you what we're doing next. Uh, we've made cells uh, that are lacking ADMTS9. These RPE1 cells don't express ADMTS20. So knocking out ADMTS1, which you see here, on the western blot is sufficient to remove functional enzyme for both these genes. And in turn, uh, those cells have uh, a complete absence of cilia, which you see here, and the absence of ADMTS9, which is recycled by clathrin-mediated endocytosis and taken to specific vesicles at the base of the cilium. So what we're doing now, using our forward uh, proteomics approach, is to uh, grind up these cells and compare them to see what substrate cleavages are affected in the mutant cells. So these are two examples of uh, specific mouse mutants we're pursuing. Uh, this is an example of the approach that we uh, use for our forward degradomics approach. It's a complex workflow for preparation of samples, but in principle, it's quite simple. You take a population of protein plus protease or without protease, and you label their N-termini at the protein level using either dimethylformamide or ITRAC. You then digest these using trypsin. You extract the trypsin peptides, which have reactive N-termini using a specific polymer. And what comes through in the reaction at the end is a, an abundance of neoepitopes or N-termini that have been spared by this uh, triptic peptide exclusion process. And you then subject those to mass spectrometry. So we are applying this now to a number of cardiovascular diseases. So we uh, have a great collaboration with our uh, surgical colleagues at the Cleveland Clinic, who have one of the world's biggest caseloads of aortic surgery uh, and valve surgery. And we're also looking at, uh, at mouse models of heart failure, fibrosis, and so on, to understand the changes in matrix proteolysis that may contribute to some of these uh, pathologies. So I don't have too much data from that to show you now because it's really a lot of information we get and we'd like to get many more uh, cases studied before we can make generalizations. But this is an example of what comes through. You get a, uh, this is essentially an enrichment process for N-terminal peptides, whether they're original N-terminal peptides or resulting from cleavages 
in, vit in vivo. And so we pull out an abundance of these block peptides. We can sequence them. We can identify where they lie within a given protein. And that allows us to identify putative new proteoforms. Among these peptides, the majority are internal peptides derived by proteolysis. So even a normal tissue contains a vast amount of uh, proteolytic cleavage and stable uh, cleaved uh, proteoforms that presumably have a function of some kind. So here's an example. It didn't translate well into this slide format, but I'll just click through it quickly and show you the kind of information we get. So this is fibrinogen A. These are cleavage sites that we detected uh, in a vascular wall from an aortic aneurysm. And you can see here that there are multiple cleavage sites. And we can consult with uh, uh, MEROPS, which is a protease database, and identify those sites that are known, marked by the K, versus those that are unknown. And in time, one can then try and figure out which proteases which we are in the tissue, which we can determine by mass spec, and also figure out which of those proteases are contributing to these cleavages. So um, I'd like to thank the team that's involved in this work. Uh, one of the things that the uh, Paul Allen Frontiers program has given us an extraordinary opportunity to do is to, is to work on something we never could have done in the lab otherwise. Mine is a regular biology lab, and this was our first foray into proteomics. So we've assembled a team of proteomics experts to work with us. And it's also given the fellows and students in the lab an incredible opportunity to train in integrated developmental biology or biology and mass spectrometry. We also work with an exceptional group of uh, cardiac surgeons who take time out of their busy schedules to help us uh, with this project. So thanks again to the uh, Frontiers program. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.